Welcome to another presentation from the CV Academics Foundation, home of the AMP Honors Program. All right, yeah. so we are with uh, Dr. Andy Kirk of uh, his own Pewaukee Clinic Biomechanics. A body mechanics. Body, body. mechanics, yep. yes, sir. Yep, yep. Awesome. So me and Brandon will help uh, bring some information to the platform, and I'll let B kick it off. Okay. All righty. So uh, we kind of just wanted to start with a little bit of background for those who don't know who you are, which seems a little surprising, but um, can you just give us a little background on like your schooling and your educational path to get where you are right now? Sure, sure. I, uh, I actually, it, it, I'll do respect, Taylor. You called me doctor, but I'm not a doctor. So I'm so old that I have a bachelor's degree in physical therapy. So you should call me bachelor for, perhaps, but I am, I am married and I married one of my classmates from PT school. So um, yeah, I went to physical therapy school. I wanted to be an athletic trainer, uh, like at the division one college level was my initial goal. I kind of knew that when I was a eighth or ninth grader, strangely enough, very nerd like. And um, um, I was told to become a PT athletic trainer would be the best combination to get that kind of a job. So early on, I and through high school and everything, I knew I was going to try to get into PT school. And I knew I was going to have to in college take the ominous physics and a little bit of calculus and some uh, chemistry and kind of knew that was coming. Those were, I liked science, but I didn't necessarily like those. You know, I, I'm more of a life sciences guy and anatomy and things like that. So I could start preparing really in high school for taking those classes and making sure my math was up to speed. And I went to college I, at Nebraska, University of Nebraska, and I was a student athletic trainer there for three years. And I was working on what, at that time, they just called it, this is 37 years ago. So I don't think anyone watching this is even remotely that age. So but 37 years ago, you didn't get a, even a degree in athletic training. They were just starting to have degrees in athletic training or they were getting bachelor's and master's degree, excuse me. And uh, physical therapy, again, was a bachelor's degree program. So I went three years. You could complete two years of college to fulfill pre-PT prerequisites. And um, we'd go to college anywhere at that time. And I went to Nebraska, um, took on my prerequisites, applied to physical therapy school, had an interview and had to... Uh, um, have recommendations and have good GPA, which my GPA was okay. It wasn't as good as a lot of people's. I think I had like a 3.7 or 3.6 on some of the required classes. It wasn't a 4.0 and I was nervous about that. Very hard to get into school and they interviewed at, I, they interviewed like 100 people and took 16 and for some reason I fooled them and got in. So uh, I think one of the things they did was they, they put a lot on the interview. Physical therapy is really a people uh, skills profession. And I, th I think they recognize that you need to be able to talk and relate to people well. And that's something I, that's probably my forte. I'm not very smart, but I can talk. And so uh, once I get into school, I, I had been a student athletic trainer for three years at Nebraska, went to PT school in Omaha at the medical center, University of Nebraska Medical Center. That's a two-year program and graduate with a bachelor's degree in physical therapy. And at that time, most of the PT programs were transitioning to master's entry level. And of course, now it's progressed to where they now doctor, uh, doctor of physical therapy is pretty much the norm. So um, to start out as a PT, you'll graduate with a doctorate of physical therapy now, as everyone watching this probably knows if they're interested in physical therapy. As soon as I graduated PT school, I had, had done all the hours from my curriculum for athletic training. So I went and took the athletic training uh, national certification exam. So I had that dual credential pretty much within a few months after graduating PT school. And I, but I also knew that I really didn't want anymore. I had changed my direction. I didn't want to be a college athletic trainer. I wanted to be uh, a clinical physical therapy, sports medicine, manual therapy kind of guy. And so, um, I had to take quite a bit of continuing ed in those days to learn how to do manual physical therapy, learn how to, we had the basics really well. We had anatomy, histology, biomechanics, all the things, basic physical therapy uh, treatment uh, modes taught to us very well in school, but not that much manual therapy. And even now they try, they teach, they have more time than we did. So they try to teach some manual therapy and I, 
some of the recent new grads I've hired are really pretty good at manual therapy coming out of school. It was stuff that maybe took me five years out of school to learn they've, they've got when they come out, but they still have a lot to learn. And so that's one bit right there is after you're done with school, you have just started learning how to do physical therapy and manual therapy. And it's, it's probably two of every profession, but, but you got to really learn with a lot of continuing ed and good mentors. So I worked in a general acute hospital right out of school, took a lot of continuing ed classes. Then I worked for a private practice out in Wauwatosa for about five or six more years. And then I joined a group practice where I became a part owner of the clinic and got some ownership, um, um, I guess, thirst at that point to be an owner of a clinic that I worked in. And there was about eight or nine of us that owned that. One of them was actually a medical doctor also and uh, PTs and one athlete trainer. <clears throat> and that, that group was called Competitive Edge. That kind of disbanded because we sold it to a national company and then started working for the national company for about a year back in the late 80s. And that's when I kind of got the desire to get back into my own and start my own solo practice, which is what I did in about 1993 or four, I think, somewhere in there. And I was just a solo practice. Uh, I had this office that I'm in right now is in downtown Milwaukee, actually. This was my first office right in Cathedral Square. And then I hired a friend of mine, another PT, and then we hired a receptionist and we were getting busier. So we just kind of, I kind of have gradually hired people as we've grown. Opened the second location in Pewaukee and uh, now still don't have a massive big company. I don't know that I know how to manage a big company anyway, but I have five other PTs in addition to myself and then three administrative staff and one person that does all our billing and then two, two uh, front desk uh, patient care coordinator receptionists that manage that. So, and then in the last two years, of course, I've, I've been a PT, <clears throat> PT 37 years and I, <coughs> I basically learned to do manual therapy, as I said, through continuing education. There's an organization called the Institute of Physical Art, which I think is an excellent um, avenue to learn manual therapy even today. Like I said, you graduate with better skills now. I'd recommend any PT to take at least a few of the IPA Institute of Physical Art classes out of school to see if they like it and if they do continue. They have a whole curriculum and a certification that I actually ended up teaching for them for about almost 30 years and uh, I don't teach for them. I stopped about three years ago and um, but I stopped just because I wanted to do some different things, but I, I was involved in helping certify and teach and so forth. And my staff was all pretty much trained by this organization also. And it allows us to really see in how bodies move and treat them with our hands, which I think is the hallmark of what we do at our clinic here. So that's some of my background. I married one of my classmates, which I don't know if that has anything to do with my profession, but it's a good thing I did. You guys so, ever argue about patient cases? No, no. We argue all the time, but not about that. No, she's a, Julie is an administrator in a hospital now. So she was a spinal cord rehab therapist. That was her specialty. Wow. And I've always been orthopedic in sports. So we kind of saw different kinds of patients. But uh, yeah, she's smarter than me. <laughs> Fascinating. <laughs> Were there any major steps? in your educational process that led you to be the manual therapist you are versus well, I, the yeah versus there you're right so there's different kinds of pts all very effective and skilled so that's a good point to differentiate what i do i'm i'm actually not a real um great expert in in what i'd call fitness training now as a pt i know how to help people get stronger and move better and so forth but i I do it mostly by changing their body in ways they can't do themselves with my manual techniques. And I dovetail that with exercise movement patterns. But quite honestly, uh, um, I, you know, I'm not the guy for you to come see to get a lot stronger or to be more sports performance training. I don't think that's my specialty. I, I'm interested in, I can help a little bit. I, I, I kind of hand that off to some of my colleagues who do that much better than I do because that's all they do. So my specialty is more fixing with my hands, which you can't quite do yourself. Like you think, well, I got a bad shoulder. I'm going to go on YouTube 
and get all the exercise I can do for my shoulder. And a good portion of people are going to get their shoulder well doing that, but not everybody. Sometimes there's things you can't quite just exercise out that it's helpful to have somebody get in there on your pectoralis minor or mobilize your capsule or do things with a dry needling or something that we do that really get it better quicker. And then you can get onto uh, training and moving more effectively that way. So, so I, I kind of knew I wanted to do this before I was a PT. It was when I was thinking about being an athlete trainer, that was kind of the divergent point for me was I saw and observed when I was pretty young, um, a guy, a physical therapist who did hands-on manual physical therapy. Um, and it's not, it's, I don't want to, con I want to contrast it to other things. It's not massage therapy. It, and this is out of respect to these other folks. It's not massage therapy. It's not chiropractic. It's not acupuncture. Um, it's different because um, PTs have a different perspective. And, and sometimes you use a team of people with all these different professions to help you get better. Uh, but that's really, that's really, uh, there's not all PTs do manual therapy. They might do a little bit, but they do, do a ton. Kind of like I do a little bit of strength training, but I'm, you really want to get rolling and improve your performance with that. I'm, I'd probably refer you to somebody beyond me. Do you know, or do you, I mean, besides the Institute of Physical Arts certifications, are you certified in like an active release or positional release therapy tool or grass thin tool assisted type no, of? No, I'm not. No, I'm not. These, those would be alternatives to what I do. And again, they can be really effective. Those are most of those things like grass thin, for example, I don't want to misrepresent them. I have to be careful here, but those are stainless steel tools. They're specifically made a certain way and you need to be trained how to use them properly. Correct. But they can free up adhesions and tissue work. And it's another way to do what I do. Um, active release also, I think that might have been developed by a chiropractor. And it's a methodology that is very effective in the right hands, in the right training. Um, but I, I, my methods do that work, but not those are kind of trademarked names that someone yeah. developed. And um, what I do kind of encompasses that, but I, I try to never say I do those things because I'm not trained in them, yeah. but yet I might get the same result. Correct. So, okay. Yeah. I wasn't sure what the overlap between IPA yeah. and ART was. Yeah. yeah, we don't use a lot of tools. I mean, I have some, I'll show you. We are nothing fancy here. We, we have various wooden tools that we use sometimes for pressure release points and so forth. They're sanded wooden tools that we use, but most of the time it's these. I, I can feel where restrictions are with my hands. And that's, that's probably the biggest part of our training is, is being able to see with my eyes, somebody that walks by and I can see their hips not moving right. Mm -hmm. And it's beyond the basic training I had in school. It's with experience too, you get so you can observe gait and you can see right where the problem probably is and know how to efficiently go after it right away and know what position to put somebody in and how you might mobilize that. And then a big part of the, Institute of Physical Art isn't just mobilizing what's tight, but it's retraining it. And they use a technique called PNF, so proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation. And it's a, it's a way of using, it was originally developed this methodology, um, oh gosh, years, I don't know, but the polio epidemic shortly after that, some of the people that were mentors of the people that taught me in Institute of Physical Art um, developed these methods of PNF. And it's a way of training scapular and pelvic patterns that then flow out into the extremities. It's, for example, teaching a, a, a movement versus a muscle, teaching the movement of shoulder elevation, for example, combined with pelvic depression, which is real important for like pushing or throwing a ball up in the air, or jumping up and grabbing something or doing a pull up. And it's using your whole body as a unit. It was originally used for stroke patients to retrain people who had half their body paralyzed, use the strong part of your body that's not paralyzed to overflow into the neuromuscular system of the weaker side. And it's magical when it's done well, how you can kind of retrain people with neurologic disorders, like which is originally how it was used, spinal cord injured, head injured patients, uh, stroke patients. And, but it really applies to just anybody. We all have, all humans have kind of some movement dysfunction it can be improved if it's trained and mobilized properly. And so I know at the end of this interview, we're going to ask a very similar question to, you know, what can you recommend to 
the students of the future. But something that I always appreciated from my mentors, whether it be at Syracuse or Clark University or when I was at the University of Minnesota as an athletic trainer was people who really knew how to see with their hands. Yeah. They closed their eyes. They could feel adhesions. They could feel muscular movement, you know, below right. the skin level. How long did that take you? <laughs> well, I did a lot of teaching. So for 30 years I taught. So I went through it both as a student to learn how to do that kind of work, which sounds as you just said that, it sounds mystical and magical. It really isn't. It is pretty cool, it's but it isn't, mystical and magical. it isn't learned from a book. Yeah, it's not learned from a book. It's really learned with someone teaching you and giving you confidence that, yep, you're, you're, you're feeling that correctly or seeing that correctly and experience. So some people I know from teaching have it before they're ever taught it. There is some folks I do believe have an inherent ability. And I don't think that matters though. <laughs> yeah. It sounds really cool too that you could be born with that ability, but I, I'm one that was not born with that. But I'm really, I'll be honest, I'm very good at it. <laughs> but it's because I've learned and I've worked hard to become that way. It's not because I was born with it. In fact, the mentors I had kind of chuckled at what I used to be like. You know, I was pretty inept with my hands. Mostly it was confidence, which is interesting. Like anything else, Whereas I got confidence that what I'm seeing I could trust, what I'm feeling I could trust. So your original question was how long did it take? I think um, it took me a year or so uh, gotcha. from my first class I ever took where I realized I needed to learn to do that. And then uh, I'm still getting better at it. I mean, that's one of the things I like about it is you don't stop improving. And I feel like I'm still learning, and, but I'm way better than I was even a month ago at it just simply because I'm still using it and working at it. So, yeah. So I want to I wanna take a second and kind of backtrack a little bit to something you said there, um, yeah. talking about mentors. Um, are there any special mentors that stand out to you that helped you with that confidence and maybe some more of those things that weren't as much in the books, but um, just still helped you as a PT? Yes. Yeah, I think... Um, I, I honestly, if I go way back, the first mentor I'd mentioned was when I was in high school and it was the head football coach. And uh, he taught me a lot about, he knew about this whole career thing in athletic training. And he really nurtured me. He wasn't, he didn't have a lot of knowledge himself, but he knew where to point me. And he did that and he reinforced me. And he gave me a book on taping. And so I'd have to give a debt of gratitude to, to two different head football coaches that were there when I was in high school. Because I was a student athletic trainer for football and um, I was scared to get hit so I didn't go out for football and uh, but that's great because that's where I kind of learned to I learned some athletic training then so then I, in college I'd say the athletic trainers that I worked with there Jerry Weber is one of the at the time he was an assistant athletic trainer George Sullivan was the head trainer at University of Nebraska and Jerry is still involved He's, you still see him on the sidelines at Nebraska football games um, at Nebraska. So he taught me a lot. And um, some of the older trainers I worked with. And then once I got out of PT school, I started taking continuing education. And the person who developed the Institute of Physical Art um, with his wife is a guy named Greg Johnson. Greg Johnson and his wife, Vicki Saliba Johnson. And they're both physical therapists. They started the Institute of Physical Art that I mentioned. And um, they taught me, first of all, how to do the work, and then they taught me how to teach it, and then they kind of mentored me all along the way. So, you know, for 30 plus years, I worked with them. And uh, then I had colleagues all along the way, you know, on all these different jobs I've had, I've had my, my peers that I learn a lot from. When you see patients with someone else, you always get another objective outsider, and they just have a different view than I do. And, um, so I'd have to name them as mentors too. Awesome. Matching onto those mentors is real important. And then being a mentor someday, you'll learn a lot too. So I've been a mentor also, and I am a mentor of my whole team now. I've kind of shifted more into that. And uh, I'm learning even more doing that. You know how it is when you teach something, you get a lot different perspective then too. Absolutely. So you own your own practice. You said that you you are more on the sports medicine orthopedic side what's a typical situation that you see in the clinic we actually uh 
I would, I, I always, I used to want to say, and I still do, I try to promote the sports medicine aspect of what we do, because again, I am an athletic trainer. I work at a high school where I see a lot of athletic injuries at the high school, and that's an avenue into our clinic. But honestly, I bet about 50 or 70% of our patients sometimes are not necessarily a sports related injury. It's really uh, active individuals. So, so I try to have everybody think of themselves as an athlete. You know, no matter what age, because that means, okay, I got to be active. I want to move well. I want to feel better. I want to be at the best I can be. And that's what an athlete's always trying to do. And most people, I do think, perceive themselves that way. Even if they haven't worked out or exercised for three years, they still picture themselves as ready to go back to that at any moment, you know, yeah. if, if somebody mm -hmm. can help them. And sometimes it's just a matter of, okay, let's fix your neck and back. And let's start you on a walking program, you know. So is that an athlete? I don't know. But that's a there's a number of people like that in our clinic. And we and then a year later, what's really cool is that individual is running 20, 30 minutes, four or five times a week, and they're strength training. <clears throat> okay, so now they are. And that's I think you know, they envision themselves that way and you become that eventually. So um, a typical patient, a common scenario in our clinic is back and neck pain, but there's also People with overuse injuries, we see a lot of triathletes and multi-sport athletes, so um, they can get a lot of injuries sometimes through overuse, knee, ankle, foot problems. Uh, we see a lot of people who do a lot of lifting and crossfitters and things like that at times, and they sometimes can have a lot of shoulder and neck problems, and it's, uh, it's cool to see if you can fix their body to where they can do what they want without it being a limitation anymore. And um, and I think that's it. And then we, we do have people of Medicare age, so over 65, that are really trying to just see if they can still get up and walk comfortably, if they can maybe play pickleball or something like that, you know, or uh, um, golfers. Uh, just everybody, we're trying to see if we can help get to that next level that they envision. So that's a typical thing. We do have, too, less so than some clinics, but we have several orthopedic surgeons, <clears throat> a couple in particular, that, um, you know, we're a freestanding, independently owned clinic. So we're not owned by the hospital or by the doctors. And so we don't have a pipeline of patients coming from a doctor that would maybe own our clinic. A lot of surgeons nowadays own a physical therapy clinic attached to their medical practice and surgical practice. And so when you have surgery by one of those doctors, you often end up going to that clinic for your therapy. And that can be fine. That's nice because the therapist can communicate with the doctor. They're all right there. But we're, we're freestanding. We do get a number of post-op referrals from a few doctors that we refer to. So most of the time, I'm talking to orthopedic surgeons often not so much about sending us patients, but learning what they do so that I can learn who to send to them. And we're a referral source for them is what I try to introduce myself as. They're usually more willing to talk to me then too. Absolutely. Because, and then also uh, it's kind of cool because if they're good, if we like what they do and we have a philosophical match, over the years we develop a relationship where now, hey, guess what? They're starting to send us patients. And but we really market the public directly. We don't, most PT clinics, I think, go to doctors first. Mm -hmm. They're in all the insurance plans. And then they go to the doctor about, hey, can you send us patients? And so we really don't do that a lot. We do some. But again, it starts out as us getting to know them, see if we are a good fit, and we can help their practice by sending them patients first. And if they like us, they start sending them to us. So we spend a lot of time at races and things like that going right to the public themselves. Awesome. Or gyms, uh, uh, personal trainers, they make great referral sources or partners for us because we need them and they need us. You know, we need to get the patients out of here and, and working out on their own in a healthy way. And a personal trainer can do that way better than I can. You know, I want them out of here so they can be doing something different than being a patient. Yeah, absolutely. That's awesome. Um, so what would you say are some of the details that are most important to you? Now, I know you said that um, one of the attributes you think is best of yourself is your ability to talk and communicate with people. Um, do some of those attributes 
go past just knowing what you're doing and being able to physically fix someone into uh, making sure they're comfortable with you and making sure that that they trust you and they can understand what you're doing? Does that have a big impact on the work you do? Yeah, that's a really interesting point, Brandon. It's right. It's uh, that <clears throat> the rapport with the patient is hesitate to say as important or more important than what you do with them. And I don't mean to say you can just do anything and BS them. I don't mean that. It's more, but if you don't have rapport, your skills don't matter very much. And there's a lot of healthcare providers like that. So, and I, and again, I don't, you can be an introvert, for example. It's okay to be introverted. There's nothing wrong with that. <laughs> but one-on-one -on -one with a patient, you need to just develop rapport. How to, how to get to know somebody get away from like, I get a new patient, I'm sitting at my computer trying to get all the information down as I interview them at first. It's very important in that first visit to not worry about that as much, but look them in the eye and talk to them and get to know them and find out how they're feeling and have them see it, honestly have them like me. <laughs> right, and they aren't gonna like me if I am distant and I don't care. So um, yeah, that's, that's the rapport building is probably the top skill. That's why I don't have to hire somebody to work for me that has all the skills yet. But if they, uh, the manual skills and the, most of the knowledge is good. I don't have to teach them everything, but, but for the most part, I can have a younger PT that's not very experienced, but they're really a go-getter. They really like relating to people. They care about people. They're not trying to just shove them through and work on volume. They're trying to really see if they, they can really want to try to care and, and see people get better. So that's the most important skill. You can always learn how to do things, but you got to make sure you're focused on rapport. Yeah, and you can definitely tell when it's genuine yeah. um, and they're actually listening to you, like you said, looking them in the eyes, things like that. Yeah, it's really weird too. Another thing that I have gotten better at that's still challenging is, is getting that rapport with somebody that's really different than you. You know, I can have rapport with somebody my age, some guy that's married. I'm 60. So some 60-year-old guy comes in here. And he's been married 30 plus years. He and I get along right away because we're like cut from the same mold pretty much. You know, he's easy. But but um, a 14-year-old girl, a little different. You know, I have to get on her level a little bit and try to relate to her. Um, somebody's grandma comes in. You know, I got to relate to her. And that's one of the fun challenges of a career like this. If you look at it that way, is or somebody coming in that's really angry about some injury they have that they've been dealt some injustice by their employer and it's a work comp injury or it's an accident case and they're just angry, um, learning how to listen to them, let them blow through that so you can get on to what you need to work on beyond just anger, you know. And so that's not always easy. I don't always succeed, but there's some people that uh, are harder for each of us to get along with. And this job forces you to, to interact with more different kinds of people. So that's fun. Is there, is there anything that um, kind of universally you've started to notice has, has helped you with that? Or is it more a case-by-case -case basis? Failure. Failure has helped me get better at that. Because I've, I've failed at it with so many people. I'm, <laughs> I'm so much more relaxed at work than I used to be. And I think it's because I was trying so hard I was under so much stress when I first was a PT of trying to do everything perfect and right the right way and be the best I could be and, and get along with everybody. And quite honestly, you don't naturally get along with everybody. Some do more than others, but I, I would be pretty, if I had 10 patients and two of them were not doing very well and not getting better, I had to get over my own lack of my own. It wasn't about me. You know, I, I had to get over that. To, uh, I'd be all worried about those two instead of the 80% that are doing great. So I think I've learned to quit being such a perfectionist and that has helped me a lot. That This field, physical therapy, athlete training, healthcare, tends to draw people that are perfectionists. And it, perfectionism helps you succeed in the world. It also can hamstring you a bit. You have to learn to get past that. And I've seen that in myself and others, just learning how to do your best and let it go and move on keep trying to get better but you don't have to be perfect no one is <laughs> awesome so what about being a physical therapist keeps you coming back day in and day out well i think because i keep learning 
And in fact, now I'm learning to the point where I'm running my business more than treating patients. That's a new job that I just took here at my own, my own practice. I owned all these years, but I really just started running it as an owner probably two, two years ago. I just kind of let everybody take care of themselves and run themselves. So gotcha. I'm, I'm learning because I've, I've signed on with a group that's teaching me how to do this. So I have a coaching group to teach me how to manage my practice. And it's caused me to take on, learn something new. All along before that, I was always learning new methods of treatment, new methods to get better at what I'm doing. Um, and it's just infinite information to learn. So learning is what's kept me. Uh, if I start feeling burned out and losing creativity, it's because I wasn't learning anything new for a while. I wasn't reaching out, getting out of my comfort zone a little bit. Awesome. So last question for you here. We won't take up too much more of your time. Um, there's probably a lot of ways you can go with this, but what is one piece of advice that you would give to students looking to get into physical therapy? Um, and with a little bit of an asterisk on there, um, now with COVID, has, does that change anything? Yeah, I don't know, man. COVID is weird. It'll, this will balance out. So I'm going to skip the COVID thing first. Like, I, <laughs> they're still going to have school, right? And one of the things that happened with COVID is internships were cut short because they threw all the students out of the clinic. So I don't know. That's There'll be a way. I don't know what it is, but, you know, a vaccine would be nice, but we'll see. I mean, eventually we'll get a better handle on this, and it's already improving. Our clinic is getting more patients in it now, so I know it's coming back. I don't know about the whole economy, but that way. So healthcare is still going to be there. People still need us. So it's just a matter of how it's delivered. Um, the one piece of advice I'd give, I think, is uh, if it's your dream to be a PT, don't be discouraged by how hard you hear it might be to get in. And don't be discouraged if you don't get in at first. Maybe you've got to try again in a different way um, if it's really what you want. Um, it's... Uh, uh, what else would I want to say about that? For example, schooling is hard. I've seen a lot of high school kids say they want to be a PT and they go to college one semester and they take like chemistry class and they don't like the class or physics. They don't like the class and they don't do great at it, but they just don't like it. So they think, oh, I don't want to be a PT. It has nothing to do with being a PT. Those early classes, you just got to get a good grade and move on. You don't have to love it. And you might, you might be a natural in those classes and that won't be your issue. But if you're at all discouraged by whether you like those basic science classes, just take them and get a decent grade anyway. And if you can, and, and don't, it's not what physical therapy really is. So it's a hurdle to get over. Physics is like that too. But you know, they're not, they're, there are classes you can do well at. You just have to work sometimes and it's, it's not always how your brain works. Um, Absolutely. And try to meet as many, try to do what you're doing right now. Listen to people and meet as many people as you can that may be in the field that can, that can help you see if it's a right fit for you. I've had people come observe me that I thought were going to want to do this. And they're like, no, oh, I don't like that at all. And they're doing something completely different now. And that's cool. <laughs> it's just not for everybody. So, but you don't know until you get a chance to sample it, you know? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. There's also a lot of different kinds of health care. I have a friend who is an athletic trainer. She worked with me. She tried to get into PA school and couldn't get in, which is crazy. She'd be a fantastic PA. So I don't know the whole story. It's competitive to get into PA school, very much so. Maybe more than PT even. I don't know. And she ended up becoming, went into nursing. So she just found another avenue to get to do about the same thing. And um, she's super successful working in an ER now as a you know, an ER nurse, and she just loves it, and she's doing great. So, you know, just <clears throat> there's lots of ways to get to where you want to go. Don't give up. Awesome. Well, we have less than a minute, so thank you very much, Dr. Or, sorry, excuse me. It's okay. Mr. Andy Kirk. Just good old Andy. <laughs> thank you very much for your time, Andy, and we, uh, yeah. we hope to see you in the clinic and observe a little bit. Well, I appreciate yeah, it, guys. Good work. This has been a presentation of the CV Academics Foundation, home of the AMP Honors Program.